right, welcome to the Let It Fly show inside the Let It Fly Sports Bar in the Capital District. I am Michael Severe. My partner, Josh Jones, is off this week. He's got baby duties taking care of the little one, and so we're going to fill in. Our guest this week is Trey Alexander. Creighton Jr., of course, they finished off their work in Pittsburgh, and now they're going to be headed to Motown. We're going to talk about that, of course. We also ask you to subscribe subscribe to the page, whether it is on YouTube or follow us on Facebook or Twitter, Instagram. It helps out. We appreciate that. So subscribe, like, follow, all the things you're supposed to do. They always say, so subscribe, and then desubscribe, and then subscribe again. It gets you more subscribers. It's very strange the way that works. And like the page a lot, too. Letitflyshow.com is the website if you want to check that out. Brought to you by Bud Light. It's like when you're hanging out here at the Let It Fly Sports Bar or you're in your basement or wherever you are, it is always a great time for Bud Light. It brings you easy drinking and easy buckets throughout Nebraska. Easy to drink and easy to enjoy. Bud Light, our primary sponsor. And, of course, if you're looking for an elevated place to go and check out some sports and a great sports bar with great food, so many TVs. Let it fly sports bar. We don't have any food this week, but if I could recommend one thing that you should try, it is the all day breakfast sandwich. All day breakfast sandwich is outstanding. It is a bruschetta bun, fried egg, ranch slab bacon, crispy onions, and hash brown. It is a great sandwich. And like it says, breakfast all day long. If you have a feeling at three o'clock in the afternoon to feel like breakfast, grab the sandwich. If you're here for the brunch, grab the sandwich. It is outstanding. So many things happening this weekend. We're taping this actually on a Tuesday, so we got a little bit extra time. Thursday, March Madness watch party. Supernovas are playing The Rise. What city is The Rise from? Anybody? What? What city? Grand Rapids Rise. Okay. Supernovas, that's at 7 o'clock on Thursday. Friday, what do you think it is? Creighton playing. March Madness Crazy Watch Party, 9 p.m. It's a 9.09 start. Meg, I'm going to be sleeping. I'm going to take a nap about 4, wake up about 7 so I can watch it, stay up all the way through it. It's tough, man. It's tough being old. Um, and then Saturday, more March Madness Watch Party, Supernovas versus The Thrill. Anybody? Thrill? What city is that? Vegas. Vegas Thrill. I like that. actually works out. 6 p.m., Catch the Supernovas right here at the Sports Bar. And then Sunday, March Madness Watch Party, all the games on Sunday. Hopefully, if everything goes right, Creighton's playing on Sunday after beating Tennessee. Let's get to the headlines before we get to our guests. First of all, Creighton, men's basketball, the last of our four state teams, Nebraska men, Nebraska women, Creighton men, Creighton women, Creighton men are the last, still going, and played probably one of the best games so far in March Madness. The game against Oregon on Saturday night was amazing. It's so many parts to it. The Jays struggled missing open shots in the first half so badly that they go to the sideline reporter talking to Coach Mack, and he's, the, the, he says something like, um, had some open shots. And he goes, open? Oh, yeah, they were open. And they missed a lot of them. But you had the Ducks slowing everything down. It allowed, I think, eventually Creighton to kind of get in their rhythm. You had the battle of the bigs, Ryan Kalkbrenner against Dante uh, 19 points for Crockburner and 14 rebounds and five blocks. Dante had 28 and 20. 28 and 20, and he also had two blocks as well. And then the matchup that really did the whole thing, you have a guy like Jermaine Cousinard who's doing everything for Oregon, but you have four other guys along with Crockburner, but you go to three. You got Trey Alexander, who's our guest, of course, on the show, Baylor Shireman and Stephen Ashworth. Listen to these numbers. 32 points on 33 shots for Cousinard, right? 6 of 12 from 3. The Jays, their big three, 49 points on 55 shots, 13 of 32 from 3. It was enough in the second half to get it done. And, of course, you had Baylor Shireman hitting that big shot into regulation, coming off of the missed front end of the 1-1, one and, one, and then you had Cousinard that misses the shot as he is going to the basket. So it allows Creighton to get in overtime and win it. You had big threes by Ashworth. You had the huge putback dunk by Jason Green. And you had the three by Cockburner as well. Everybody had a part in that game doing something to help him win, which means, as I said, Creighton moves to playing that night game on Friday, 9-09 start against Tennessee Volunteers. Number three rated defense under Ken Palm defensively is – Tennessee, 11th adjusted offense is Creighton. So you have a matchup of a great defense against a very good offense. That's going to be fun. Tennessee has played a tougher schedule than the schedule that Creighton played, but the three teams that got in from the Big East are all still around. Eight teams got in for the SEC, only two left. 
That moves us to our, our second point, headlines. ACC, a quarter of all the teams in the Sweet 16. You got 8-1 and one overall. UNC, Duke, Clemson, and North Carolina State all in the Sweet 16. The Big 12, which is probably the deepest of all the conferences throughout the whole season, they're sitting with two, Iowa State and Houston. They got eight in as well. And then, of course, in the Big 10, you got, one, you got two left in the Big 10, one from the Pac-12 in Arizona, one from the Big West, and the Mountain West has San Diego State, who really, over the last three years, you go look at what San Diego State's done during the regular season and what they've done in the tournament. It really is impressive what that team has done, of course, losing in the national championship game last year. And one more headline, in case you didn't know, living here in the state of Nebraska, new AD for Nebraska, Troy Dannon, he had his press conference on Tuesday. Spring practice for Nebraska began on Monday, so a lot of football stuff going on. Interesting stuff from Troy Dannon. Um, had a chance to follow his career a little bit. My wife got her master's from Tulane. Dannon was at Tulane for eight years. He helped add a improved football stadium. He helped add a improved baseball facility, training facility, track, all kinds of things. He turned that campus around. And by the time he left, the last year he was there, Tulane beats USC in a big game in the, in the bowl season, did everything he could do there. Goes to Washington, and then I'm sure he's expecting to stay at Washington for a long time, but Nebraska comes calling. And you got to remember, Washington's coming to the Big Ten, but it's going to take a while for them to get the full amount, right, the payments. He comes to Nebraska, comes back to the Midwest. He's from Iowa, so it makes a lot of sense that he left Wisconsin. I mean, he left Washington so soon, so he comes to Nebraska. Interesting press conference if you didn't listen to him. And three quick questions for spring practice for Nebraska. First, you got to figure out if you need another quarterback. You've got two freshmen, and you've got Heinrich Harburg. Not a whole lot of experience in that room. Can you figure out enough during the spring to say, that's all I need, we're good? Or do you need after spring to go out and maybe try to grab somebody from the portal? It's a tough question. It's a hard decision to make, but they've got to figure that out. I don't know if you can go into the season with two true freshmen and hiring Carberg with eight starts under his belt. I don't know if you can do that. Uh, number two, getting your new wide receivers ready to go. You've got this weird mix. You've got the portal guys, Jamal Banks and Isaiah Nayor. Then you have the really young guys, some of the true freshmen, like uh, where well you have the guys from last year, Jalen Lloyd and Malachi Coleman. And then you have Ja'Cory Barney, Devin Hall, all those guys, and then you have the leftovers. The leading receiver from Nebraska last year, do you know, Phil, executive producer of the Let It Fly show, do you know who the leading receiver was for Nebraska last year? Leading receiver last year. You have an idea? Uh, I can give you a hint. What Why, the leading receiver was a wide receiver. I'll give you a hint. As my friends would say where I'm from, he was wide. Alex Bullock is his brother. Yeah, Bullock was the number one wide receiver, caught the most um, last year. He's, he's returning leader. Garcia, Garcia Castaneda is coming back as well. And then the third one, D-line. You got Ty Robinson coming back, Nash Upmaker coming back. You got a whole bunch of young guys on the outside figuring out that rotation because they have about eight to ten guys. They got to figure out how, how well they're going to play. I know they rotated a lot last year. I imagine we won't see as much of that this year, but we've got to see how that goes. That's a big part of it, and I can't wait to see how Cam Linhart and Raleigh Van Poppel develop their games as well. Those are some questions about spring football. Coming up next, we'll talk to our guest. He is a junior, Creighton Blue Jay, one of the few guys that didn't have necessarily the season that got him some of the accolades, but made so many big plays during the year. We'll talk to Trey Alexander next. I want a Sunday. All right, welcome back. Time to get to our guest. Straight from Pittsburgh, getting ready to go to Detroit, hanging out here for a while. Trey Alexander, great and sweet man. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. Do you how long does it take for you to get come down from something like that night on Saturday? Uh, it takes a while. I mean, the, that night I don't think much of the team slept because <laughs> everybody in the hotel was kind of, kind of loud at the bottom and things like that. So when we got back from the game, it was pretty. It was, it was a vibe. So it was, it was nice, and we we had a great time. Oh, so. I bet. Fifty minutes, not the longest you played this year. You had fifty three against Seton Hall, but did you feel that at all the next day? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, especially not after sleeping much that <laughs> night. Yeah. 
So we woke up, got on the plane, things like that. My body wasn't feeling the best, but, I mean, it's a part of the game. So. Yeah. I remember when Jeremy got here and started working with the team, fitting conditioning-wise, and there was the, these numbers that showed that, Nebra- that Creighton had dropped off, like, in late in the second half. Mm-hmm. And his goal was to make sure you guys had better endurance and everything. How much do you attribute the work you did with him, you guys have done with him, to how you guys played on uh, Saturday? Uh, I think it's big. Uh I mean, if you know Jeremy, he's all about analytics and kind of going on, kind of going off of not really results oriented is what he likes to say. Nothing mm-hmm. is really results oriented with what he does. So everything that we do, like the day after a game, most of the top seven players really don't work out. We go, we go in there and we kind of like stretch and like roll instead of lifting on the mm-hmm. days we're supposed to lift day after a game, which is, I think helps pretty much. And then obviously kind of like tells us throughout the week to make sure that we're not doing too much extra and making sure that we, obviously we have our whoops that keep up with our sleep, Mm -hmm. sleeping habits and things like that. So there's a lot of different things that go into it that not a lot of people see. Is there something that he ever had you do that you were like, I don't like this or (laughs) it was Uh, a little too much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my (laughs) freshman year, um, I actually had to like send him pictures of my e- of like what I would eat for my five meals of the day. <laughs> and at first, I was like, "This is very like weird and things yeah, like that." Yeah. But then, like, I started to gain weight. Like, I went from like one seventy five. Now I'm at one ninety five and things like that. So, I mean, obviously, it worked out pretty well. But it was at first, it was like one of those things. Like, what, you, <laughs> what, what am I getting out of this? But yeah. yeah, we don't you know we don't talk enough about and Trey Alexander joining us here on Let It Fly Show. We don't talk enough about sleep. And we certainly don't talk enough about putting the right things in your body. Th- yeah. That combination helps with recovery and everything else? Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, if if, if you've kind of been around us, you know that we, like, we do a lot of sandwiches. Uh, uh, like, after games, we do a lot of, like, sandwiches. We mm-hmm. make sure that we get, like, protein shakes before we lift, after we lift. Mm-hmm. And then after games, we, we tend to just, you know, kind of – he makes make sure that we drink a lot of water and things of that sort. Sure. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it. We have these fireflies that we have to wear – after every game on our legs, they're kind of supposed to like, kind of like a stem, mm-hmm. like that kind of pulsates your your bottom half of your body, like for your legs and things like that. So, so it's a lot of different things that go into it. So it works the muscle. Yeah, exactly. And gets you ready. Yeah. Um, so that's the physical part of it. Yeah. First half on Saturday, no one really shooting really well for you guys. Yeah. Can you talk about the, the mental aspect of work you've done so you don't let that take away from what you can do the rest of the game? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it, exactly what you said. It's kind of just the work. Uh, one thing that if if you notice with me, there's never a, a shot that I feel like I can't make. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm even if I miss five straight shots, I'm going to shoot the next wide open one. I feel like that's something that all of us have on this team in terms of me, Baylor, Steven, Kalkbrenner, mm-hmm. uh, Mason, just guys like that that, you know, you know, work on our game a lot. And I think that that's what comes with it is the confidence portion. So I think that's – one of the biggest things for somebody that plays a sport is is when you have that confidence, it kind of makes you hard to stop and kind of makes you ignorant a little bit. So, so you left out Bello. That's one of the most supreme confident dudes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, like, he thinks every shot. He's yeah. like, I can make this. I can make this shot. There's no doubt. Um, one of the things I noticed in that in the game against Oregon as it went along, they were starting to kind of get – try to get a little physical with you guys. Maybe there was some talking going back and forth. Do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy that part of the competition? Yeah, I mean, I love that that portion of of sports. I think that it's uh, what makes the game as fun as it does. Uh, I think uh, the competitive nature inside of me wants to, you know, kind of talk back and forth and then make sure that I have to back it up because, I mean, you don't want nobody talking to you. You got zero points or something like that, so (laughs) – I mean that that portion definitely fuels me, and I I love talking back and forth. So is is coach cool with it? I know sometimes coaches aren't. Uh, into yeah, that. I mean he's not into it, but I feel like it's something that I've always done since I've been at Creighton. Is kind mm-hmm. of talk back and forth, say little slick stuff there and things like that. <laughs> I mean he tried tells me to stop, but it really doesn't doesn't do much. I mean that's just kind of so kind personality. Of, yeah, right? I was about to say it's kind of just who I am. Yeah, Trey Alexander joining us here on Let It Fly Show. One of the things that. Anybody that watches them knows that late in games, you're probably going to have the ball in your hand. Can you talk about the way you prepare for that? Because it's something – I, I, I mentioned Jordan to you earlier. It's a great commercial where he's talking about how many times he made last shots, mm-hmm. but then how many he missed, right? Yeah. So you make the one against Villanova, obviously. You miss some as well. Can you kind of talk about how you prepare for that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just what comes with the games. I think that the only thing that you can do to work on is just make sure that – you're getting in repetition, you you have a go-to move, which, I mean, for me, it's just kind of making sure I get to my spot for mm-hmm. me. So, 
I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that everybody that's had like a clutch situation knows what move they want to go to if they if there's a certain situation. I feel like that's the same with me. And I mean, like you said, I got to that shot and Villanova made it. And yeah. then, I mean, I kind of got off balance and kind of missed a shot that I'll normally make in the Oregon OT game. So, I mean, it's just a part of it, though. I mean, it, it comes with the game. Like Michael Jordan said, it, it, he's missed many more shots, game winning shots than he's made, but people only remember the ones that you make. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, every, every time that I that I have the ball at the, end, at the end of the game, I'm playing to make the right play, but I'm probably going to shoot it. I know you never make the ones you don't take. Yeah. So you exactly. got a chance if you take it, right? So exactly. that's a big part of it. When you, so like in that situation, is that something you guys are talking about in the huddle? They call the play for you, or you just know at this point that you're probably going to get the, the last shot of a game? Uh, I mean, nine times out of 10, we, if, if it's a, timeout situation Mac usually draws up the play or like just says like what he kind of wants me to do when I have the ball mm -hmm. uh probably like one out of the other 10 times is if when we're not in a timeout I just go get it and then I'm kind of like just either call for a ball screen or I just go one-on-one -on -one, so walk us through Baylor's shot in the regulation yeah. so Dante misses the front end the one-on-one -on -one. Mm -hmm. you guys got um, right around 20 seconds what was the what was the play call what was kind of the plan for that uh yeah, I mean I knew that uh Baylor was kinda he was kinda in the rhythm mm -hmm. after making those two free throws. So I mean we kinda came down. I told Calk to set him like a pin down, try to get him open and things like that. Came off the pin down, didn't have the initial shot that he wanted, mm -hmm. so Calk kinda re screened him. And I mean he got to a spot, he was able to be really patient and then he was able to knock down a, a pretty tough shot in my opinion, the one leg mm -hmm. shot. So I mean obviously I've seen him work on it a couple of times, but it was a really big shot, so obviously it saved our season. It's really old school. You have some old school game in you. That kind of that Dirk Nowitzki one leg that he shot. You have the kind of Michael Jordan or Kobe turnarounds. A lot of people don't shoot that now. It's either a three or a layup. Yeah. Why, where, where did, why did you decide that was going to be part of your game? Uh, I mean, I've just seen a lot of people, like, like you said, kind of old school people use mm -hmm. it. I mean, some of my favorite players to watch are kind of your Kobe Bryant, your Michael Jordans. I like watching Kyrie. I feel like mm. Kyrie's a really good – Mid-range shooter, so, I mean, you just kind of see those people do those moves and then you tend to work on it because, I mean, obviously there's something about it that makes it so poetic. So, I mean, I, li I like to shoot that shot a lot. I work on it more than anything. Uh, and, I mean, it just feels like it's it's one of the easier shots for me. So, I mm -hmm. mean, so many times I worked on it, it kind of became easier, and I feel like that's kind of one of the shots that I know that if I get here, then I'm going to make it nine times out of ten times, things like that. So. You kind of, you believe in the 10,000-hour the rule where you do stuff enough? Yeah, exactly. It makes it easy? Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's pretty cool. Let's, I want to talk about Cuisinart, the, the guard for Oregon. I know, I'm sure you've seen guys on fire before. Actually, yeah. seen guys on your team on fire before. What was that like watching that guy, the way he was carrying that team? And, and obviously that big three hitting the first overtime. Yeah, I mean, he, he's a great player, obviously. Uh, he got going that first night had 40 yeah came up against us I mean I feel like he was taking a couple tough shots I feel like Baylor and I kind of did a good job making him take some shots that he really didn't want to take but since he was hot he kind of took them like mm -hmm. kind of like a heat check type of thing yeah. but I mean like throughout the course of a game it looks like somebody's like really like making shots but then like you kind of look at the stat sheet after and you're like 13 for 33 yeah like, yeah that doesn't seem like that's what it was but I mean he's a great player man I mean he was he was really making our lives hard that night, and I feel like mm -hmm. him and Dante in that second half throughout the OTs really, really was the reason that they were in the game, and I mean they made our jobs really hard. So it was kind of the change you guys made late in regulation with him. I, I yeah. you kind of stopped him from getting the ball. Yeah, where he I mean we we were trying to deny him the whole game. Yeah. They did a good job of kind of off balling him, kind of figuring out ways for him to get the ball in his hands. But in the in the second half, like kind of towards the end of regulation, OT. We kind of started to double him when he came off ball screens because he wasn't really getting getting off going going one on one and things like that. At, at that point, he felt like he was getting like kind of a little winded, so he's mm -hmm. coming for ball, come off ball screens like that. And so we were able to get a couple turnovers down the stretch off of him, kind of throwing the ball away with double teams mm -hmm. and things like that. And either Dante slipped having the ball slip out of his hands and things like that. So uh, Mac made a good adjustment with the Jimmer at that point in the game, and we were able to you know kind of capitalize on it, kind of put the game away. What in terms of what's the feeling like when you know the other team is getting winded? Where where you now know you have more energy than they do? What's that like? Uh, I mean, it's, it it just gives you kind of a sense of of kind of like superiority, mm -hmm. if you if you would say. I mean, I feel like when you see the other team like walking the ball up the court, they usually plays fast and things like that. Like you're kind of like, okay, like now this is where 
if we get a stop, like we'll be able to get an easy bucket and transition like that. So, I mean, the biggest thing for us is just making making sure that when people are tired, like we're able to get those stops and being able to capitalize off of them being fatigued and things like mm-hmm. that. So I feel like that's what we were able to do with that OT. I feel like that's what really was the difference in the game. Is it frustrating? Trey Alexander joining us here on Letter Fly Show. Was it frustrating the way they were playing, walking the ball up, burning 30 seconds up? Is that frustrating playing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like it's kind of them trying to know that you're trying to play fast and they're trying to take that away from you. But yeah. I also felt like like watching film, like they were a team that played fast at a couple possessions throughout the game. Like if they had an opportunity to play fast, they would play fast from what we've seen on film. And it really didn't seem like they were doing that. Like in the second half, I felt like they were really trying to slow it down, kind of mm-hmm. use the whole clock and make sure that we were, you know, just make sure that we had to play 30 seconds of defense. So Yeah, it was. It certainly helped them muddying the game up a little bit. Yeah. So you, got, you have so many guys, you mentioned earlier, so many guys that can take that last shot or that can get hot. And then you have a guy like Jason Green. Middle of the season after having the, the hand or wrist injury, he comes back, starts making plays, getting rebounds. What's it like watching him grow through the season? Uh, it's been great. I feel like uh, we're blessed to have somebody like Jason Green that, that plays the way that he does, that has the team first mentality. And I feel like that's kind of what's elevated him to the spot that he's in now is him always putting the team first. And now he's going, getting huge offensive rebounds, getting put back dunks in crunch time, putting the game away with dunks and things like that, being able to switch on to a one and guard a one, one through four, things like that. So, I mean, yeah, he, he's great to play with. If if you know Jason, he's very selfless. Uh, he obviously works really hard on the mm-hmm. offensive end and on the defensive end. So, Jason has been a missing piece for us that we kind of missed this year. And, uh, I mean, obviously, he's came around at the right time. He's been able to, to make a difference and an impact on the game. Obviously, it's exciting when you make a big shot. But when a guy like Jason – He's coming off the bench. who's had his struggles, obviously, coming off injury. How exciting is that with the putback dunk for you uh, guys? It's very exciting. I mean, number one, it was super exciting because he put the game away with yeah. it. And number two, just because you've seen, like, how much adversity he's went through this year. And I feel like uh, that adversity has kind of turned him into the player that he is now. And I feel like it's, it's kind of fueled him a little bit. Uh, I mean, coming off the hand injury, he was out for months. And now – He's back playing in a spot where I feel like he should be mm-hmm. uh, from the beginning of the season. I felt like at the beginning of the season, it was kind of Mason, Jason, Isaac kind of fighting for that four right. spot. And then uh, now we got IT playing the backup five, and now we got Jason playing the backup four. And I feel like those roles kind of fit them fit them best for what they can help the team with. It's kind of hard to see on TV, right? Because I'm not right there next to the bench, but it seems like Coach – give Steve, Steven Ashworth the most problems. Like he, it seems like if Steve is missing shots, he's on him, right? He even said it in one of the breaks. He goes, I asked him, is he going to start making some shots today? And he did. What is it like when coach is getting on like one guy? Uh, I mean. Because I know he's trying Steve, to motivate him. Yeah, yeah. Steven's one of those guys, like he has supreme confidence in himself. Sure. And his teammates. And I mean, like you can tell Steven not to shoot a shot. He's going to shoot it anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I love that about him. I feel like that's what kind of makes him a player that we need on this team. Feels like uh like that's the dynamic that he brings to his team is that confidence, that type of swagger. Uh, I feel like Steven has been able to to make others better around him because of his, his confidence and confidence in others. So I mean Mac being hard on him, we under we understand that Mac expects a lot of him because obviously coming he recruited him for yeah. him to shoot a lot of threes and for him to make some. But I mean, down the stretch he made some big ones. And so I mean, even throughout the course of the game, if you watch Stevens made threes it's always been when we were either down one down two to give us the lead to extend the lead like things like that so I mean Stevens a big shot maker one of the big shots in the game and this isn't to win the game or to put it in overtime whatever but when Baylor threw almost that half court alley-oop to Cockburn mm-hmm. is that call that's just something he saw because the people on the tv thought he was shooting that yeah and they were like what are you and then they, he catches it and dunks it boy yeah yeah I mean that's a play that we have uh not really going to say what, what no, the name of the yeah, play yeah, is, yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a play that we have. He, he, that the point of the point of it is to make it seem like Baylor's air ball, and so like the defense mm-hmm. kind of like looks into the air and sure. like kind of kind of like loses focus on boxing somebody out, and then Kalkbrenner kind of runs to the other side of the rim where Baylor's shooting it or passing it, if you will, and then he kind of it's kind of like an alley oop. So right, Coach Mack, an offensive genius. It, People, they, everybody talks about he's playing. Chess, people playing checkers, the inbounds plays, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, but I think he's the best X and O's guy in the game. I mean, I I watch other teams' plays, and I mean, I seen Mac run run a lot of different plays, and he we yeah. it, it's kind of crazy for us to, to think that we've memorized so many plays until he's like, "All right, we're running this, and we haven't ran it in like 
six or seven games, mm. and but then it ended up working because he knows, like, okay, this defense is going to do this in this situation and things like that. So, mm. What do you know about Tennessee so far? We know they're good defensively. Yeah, I mean, Tennessee is a hard-nosed defensive team. Uh, we know that it's probably – it's not probably – this is the best defensive team we played all year uh, in terms of, like, analytics and Ken yeah. Palm, things like that. I think they're, like, third or fourth in Ken Palm. Uh, but – I mean, on the offensive end, we think that we can get some stops against him if we're able to kind of manage Dalton Connect. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that he's a really good scorer, obviously, first-team All-American. But, I mean, the thing about it is we have to – we've seen them kind of get static, staticky on offense and kind of have certain, like, runs of the game, like a couple minutes throughout the game where they don't score, but they're sure. still in the game because of their defense. So, I think the key for us is being able to get stops and then being able to go from there. So Yeah, 30% defense against three-pointers, second – in overall field goal percentage defense, as you mentioned, fourth in Kim Palm defensively, so we know how good they are. What's that feeling like, whether it's the hotel or coming up on the bus or getting to the stadium, that many Creighton fans there, what's that feeling like? Uh, it's great. I mean, it's just great to see that you kind of had been able to spread some light on a city like Omaha that I think is one of the better f sport places to be. I mean, for me, it's kind of been since I've gotten to Creighton when we, when we were – a tournament team, but we weren't expected to be anything crazy mm -hmm. my freshman year. I mean, you've seen more Creighton fans than you did Kansas fans in the second round. Yep. Uh, I mean, this year, with us being as good as we are, you see it's a Creighton overload. So, I mean, I think this this past weekend, we've, if I'm thinking correctly, we kind of sold out that, that whole hotel. Like, the hotel, every time I was on the elevator, it was like five or six Creighton fans. <laughs> After the game against Oregon, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. And like it was like a almost like a pep rally at the at the hotel, like right. where we were coming through smacking fans' hands, like it was like a hundreds hundreds of fans at the hotel kinda creating a little tunnel for us. So I mean it's it's been great. I think the fans are the best in the country and I think I haven't mm -hmm. been a part of something where they have fans travel like this and go everywhere and do things like that with Curtin. This is against the rules. But I but I'm not playing. I'm looking forward to you guys winning, Purdue winning, Zach Eady versus Cockbrenner. Are you? I know you can't look ahead. You're not supposed yeah. to, but you like to see that. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, get chance to challenge against the, the best player in the country. Yeah, I mean, that'd be great. I mean, for Calk, I feel like Calk is the best defender in the country. I feel like it would be the best matchup for Zach Eady in terms of another big that's kind of on the same level as him and able to play defense against him and be able to, you know, not just be able to throw it in there and then he score over him like 20 times. I yeah. mean, I think that'd be a great, uh, a great matchup for Calk, but. I mean, I'd probably rather play Gonzaga just to play against R2. So. <laughs> oh, that would yeah. be. That's another great storyline. It's a very yeah. good storyline. Did you get a chance to watch any uh, uh, Creighton women against uh, UCLA? Yeah. Right? They had that six foot seven. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's unfair. No, she, like, she, what are you going to do? Ridiculous. It was ridiculous. That's like Zach Keating. And I know. Women. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The yeah, women's like game. Idiot. No doubt. Like, before I let you go, so obviously team goals are going really well. Personal goals, you came back to kind of prove some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel you've done that? Uh, yeah, I feel like I've came back and kind of did what I wanted to do in terms of personal goals. I mean, at the end of the day, person, my biggest personal goal was being able to kind of put myself in a situation where I could be a successful NBA player. And I feel like I kind of was able to prove the things that I wanted to the scouts and things like that. So that's really all I was worried about personally. But, I mean, team goals, like, we're there. We're still on the right track. So, mm -hmm. How exciting was it for uh, Coach Mack to resign, to extend his contract? Uh, yeah, I feel like it was something that was well overdue. Uh, I felt like Mac is one of the best things that's happened to the city of Omaha. I feel like the things he does in the community and for his players and for just the city in general is just something that you really don't see in everyday college coach. Uh, I mean, obviously he's had this much success, and I mean – uh, there's much more success to come in Omaha with Mac mm -hmm. here. So uh, one of the best in the business, and I'm happy he was able to get that extension. And hopefully we can win out so we can get the get the most wins in Creighton you know, as, a, as a head coach. So. No doubt. Last thing for sure, I know this doesn't matter to you because you're 21? 20. 20? Yeah. 9 o'clock start. 9.09 yeah. start. Nah. That's way too late for me. What's the feeling like for you guys? What's I'm, your favorite time to play? If you're going to pick one time for the game to get scheduled, what time would it be? Probably like. 12 o'clock, yeah, probably like 12. I'm I'm more of like, I mean, me and some, most of my teammates, like we don't really, not really a fan of the shoot-arounds the day of games. And yeah. so we usually like to like be able to wake up, then we eat, then we kind of go straight there. Sure. So probably like round 12 and two late games in a row. I mean, not <laughs> complaining because we're still in the tournament. Right. But, you know, you don't. 
not really the ideal time. Yeah, I'm gonna take a nap before the game. Yeah, you know that me much. Too. Yeah, Trey, we appreciate it, man. Good luck this weekend. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, thanks to Trey Alexander for joining us. It's always good catching up with him. It's weird how seeing those guys come in as young pups, whether it be Trey Alexander, who really couldn't shoot that well, little undersized. You know, skinny body, big head, got Cockburner not being able to get up and down the court. I mean, you think about the way those guys were when they got here, and then you go through Jeremy Anderson and that strength and conditioning program and what those guys are now. It really is. It's probably it's really a recruiting tool, really. You know, you got a head coach and a staff that can say, look what we've done with these guys who came in. Look how much they've developed because we put them through our program. So we have development. You recruit good guys. You develop them. The play calling is outstanding, so it really helps. Um, I mentioned this to Trey. And I know you're not to look ahead, but Creighton beats, you know, they, they get the win over Tennessee if they do that. And then Purdue wins, they're matching up. But as he said, Gonzaga wins. Then you have Creighton and Gonzaga, which would be pretty cool as well. That, of course, would be Sunday. Here's a weird stat. This is the most chalk tournament in a long time. Your one and two seeds across the board all made the Sweet 16. Last time this happened was 2019. That year, Virginia won the championship. Does anybody remember what happened in Virginia in 2018? Anybody? The 16th seed, right? So, this year, who's your number one seed who lost to a 16th seed last year and is trying to redeem themselves? The Purdue Boilermakers. Trying to do the same thing that Virginia did 2018, 2019. And they have an opportunity. I mean, they, they certainly can beat Gonzaga. And the winner coming out of Tennessee and Creighton, you never know. So they have, a ch- they have a chance to turn around just like Virginia did coming off of 2018. Thank you for joining us on the show. Special thanks to our executive producer, Phil McClain, for booking the guests. Meg, the social media maven, who's got a Utah Jazz basketball shirt on because your boyfriend played for them? I thought he was G League. Used to play for them. G League now? Is it, is it Joey? Is that your? Joey, yeah. Twin, right? Nope. Nope, not twin. Oh, okay. Really? When they? Oh, that was the year. That was the year we didn't have a thing. Twenty nine. Yep. No doubt about that. And of course, King Val Elvis on the wheels of steel, making things happen as well. Our video coordinator be cutting this all up. Mac Pittman. All of them we appreciate. And a reminder again about Bud Light, our primary sponsor. When you're hanging out, let it fly sports bar, or you're at home, or you're in a garage, or wherever you are having a good time, it brings you easy drinking and easy buckets throughout Nebraska. Easy to drink and easy to enjoy Bud Light. As Josh would say, you know how we do it. So let it fly show.